Uh, as I was sitting in a um, in a screening room on the Sony lot Saturday night, watching Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, mm. you were at the Ace downtown <laughs> doing the uh, Boogie Nights screening with Larry, which is kind of weird, isn't it? And uh, it struck me while watching it that basically Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is Tarantino's Boogie Nights. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Th- there's, a, there's a real tandem between P.T. Anderson and Tarantino on... those. Are, they're, they're both nostalgic films about certainly the film industry, different aspects of the film industry, yeah. but they also, they, they just connect to a lot of... They just, they, they capture a time and place... They're kind of doing, and they're all, they're both talking about family. Yeah. Oh, they're both about family. Uh, yeah. yeah uh, PT is being very specific. Brad, it's being a little bit more broad. Yeah. PT shooting in 96, you know, the film came out yeah. in 97, uh, but mostly set in 77. Works yeah. its way up to about, what, 80, 81, 82, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then, of course, Brad. Uh, 1969, yeah. uh, um, uh, Hollywood, and and it's really sort of interesting because watching Boogie Nights, yeah, which is hysterical, by it's the way, still funny. It's just so funny. I forgot yeah. how funny that movie was. Yeah, I forgot how many people are gone too. By the way, Philip Seymour is gone. Yeah, Robert Ridgely is gone. Uh, Michael Bert, Chase is gone, but not Bert exactly Reynolds gone. Is gone. Bert, Bert is gone. Who was supposed to be in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? Oh really? Oh, was he, he was supposed to play Spawn. He was, and, and, oh. and, he, and he, when he yeah. died, that's yeah. when they cast. Uh, they they went and cast. Uh, uh, What's his name? Uh, 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 Bruce Dern. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, out at the Spawn Ranch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah man. And uh, just so, so that was how many careers got made from that movie. I mean, huh. Don. Che- these people were people, but they weren't who they were yeah. until after this movie. Don Cheadle. Uh, Michael Jace, uh, yeah. R. Nicole Parker. Yeah. Uh, you know how many people got made by that movie? It's just really amazing. And the other interesting thing is what a baby face. I think Mark Wahlberg was probably uh, 26, 27. Yep. I think, yeah. I, I think PTA like was that. about 26 yeah. when he was making the movie. These people were ridiculously young. Uh, $15 million movie. Uh, of course, Bert and PTA did not get along. I know. You know, Thomas Jane in yeah. that movie. You know, all yeah. before they had made their bones. So, what are you going to do? It's just you know, really, really good stuff. Well, I, uh, I was, uh, I was even telling you that on my way over here, I started. So, there's a review of uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood on the CineGods.com page. Ray Green wrote it. Ray, it gave it very thoughtful. Uh, I initially agreed with all of Ray's points, but the more I think about it, the more that movie kind of sinks into my. Sinks into my skin because mm. I, you know, Quentin and I sort of had somewhat parallel upbringings. He's older, but you know, all the same TV shows, same era, both in Los Angeles. His recreation of everything from yeah. those years is exactly what I remember. Yeah. It's exactly what I remember: the hip girls and Hollywood and Spy Sergeant and all the theaters and the the the, the just you know Bruce Lee it's <laughs> I'm you know Westwood the Bruin and the Village oh it's just he, you know it's just a beautiful thing. what's interesting you know Bridge and I arrived here uh, literally January 1 1990 much of LA Hollywood LA yeah. was the same in 1990 yeah. as it had been in 1969-70 so you know 20 years on yeah. and then and then it, it was middle 90s late 90s uh, when the uh, first wave because there were a couple of waves of gentrification yeah. in Hollywood Hollywood. Remember yeah. the uh, when they put in the galaxy and all that stuff? Yeah. Might have been early 2000s, sure. late 90s. Sure, I think Mike was Wu was the uh 98 99, 98, 99 that didn't take. No. Uh they knocked all that down and then they did the Hollywood and Highland stuff middle 2000s. Yeah. And then that finally took and thus the proper gentrification of Hollywood. But but you know 1990, yeah, that dude, corner guy uh, near near Yucca and like right. Cherokee or whatever. <laughs> I got mugged on that corner <laughs> like 1994 or whatever. You know, so all of that was just one of the Vogue theater, how it used to stick out over yeah. Musso and Frank's there. Yep. Uh, all of that right. Um, Cinerama Dome. Of course, the dome back then, behind it, just that parking lot, remember? That's right. Just that dirt parking lot. That's right. We would park in all the time. Which they didn't, you know, I, 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 he didn't want to use a lot of CGI in this movie to take things yeah. out. Because you start to notice, you know, yeah. when they see. So he just, he just shot tight. Yeah, around the dome rather than getting bit. But it, it works. works. It, it works. totally works. Yeah, I remember that so well. I remember going and parking in that big old giant <laughs> ramshackle parking lot to see E.T. at the dome. Yeah, yeah. You walk, for years, we saw Fourth screens of July weekend. there. Uh, you know, I mean, screenings at the yeah. Dome, screenings at the Bruin, and the, I can't and think of how many movies we saw at the Bruin, because they were, they were across yeah. the street from one another. Uh, yeah, across the street from yeah. one another. And, uh, you know, just, man, just, you know, nostalgia, yeah. nostalgia. But, yeah, look, love this movie. It is great. I, I do think 
in order to deeply, deeply, deeply appreciate this movie, you got to be 45 plus. Uh, More than that. You know, you got to be creeping up on 50. You got to be 50. Because who, who knows who Jay Sebring is? Yeah. You, you know, you, you, you got to be 50 or over, or you have to be such a nostalgia nut that you've, you've kind of gone back to that and you've revisited that and you have enough of a, an awareness. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but you, but you do need to have a grasp of, of that moment, that, that snapshot in time, 1969 to about 1971. Yeah. 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 I mean, really? I remember the Manson murders. Oh man. I remember I, it. I can I imagine. Re- Here, I, they, re- I remember them and they were just news where I was in St. Louis. I remember we had ordinary locks on our doors until the Manson murders. And then I remember the handyman coming over and installing double locks mm. on every door. Yeah. Because of that, yeah, I remember that, and for for years, I, I you, you I looked at those double locks, and I thought of Charles Manson. Yeah, man. it did. So that's it was, what it did to the psyche of Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a deep, deep thing. And of course, uh, what's his name? Burler, the guy that wrote Helter Skelter. Yeah, who was the, uh, the, the, the DA, DA? The DA, yeah, uh, uh, down here. And that book was a big, big, big old hit. The, the the best joke in the movie, to me though. Yeah. Uh, Leonardo goes off to Italy to make some Italian films. So, yeah. you know, Clint Eastwood style. His kid, you know, yeah. he's, he's kind of playing a guy who's like a sort of quasi failed Clint Eastwood yeah. type. Yeah. And of course, he goes to make movies with the second best Italian director, is what Pacino yeah. says. You know, yeah. he's got the second best, who of course is Sergio Corbucci. Yeah. Who of course <laughs> created the Django series yes. of movies. And this is just like a beautiful joke. It is. It's just this beautiful, beautiful it joke. Is. And, you know, if you, if you get those, but again, you got to know who Sergio Corbucci is, yeah. In order for that joke to just yeah. that he really was the he's still around. Best. He's still around. Yeah, too. yeah, yeah, yeah. So neat. All oh right. well. Anyway, we're gonna we're gonna get kicking in here. The uh, a lot of things, you know. Obviously, the uh, within the the the. The film is the, the Tarantino film is being released uh, literally within weeks of the 50th anniversary of the Manson slayings. Um, August 8th and 9th is uh, just a week and a half away. But uh, it's also been the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, and that was a big old thing. Yeah. And um, we had some we had some on the on the the last couple of shows. Got some other got some other space oriented stuff that's kind of dovetailing with it. Um, this is more general. But we've got a Blu-ray and uh, digital combination set, NASA, A Journey Through Space, which is from Mill Creek. And uh, this is just a a really nice two-disc set that uh, includes seven parts of a documentary series about the history of NASA. And uh, it obviously is going to be obsolete in about 18 seconds as soon as NASA does something else, but that's okay. Uh, The history is still the history, and the history matters, and uh, it is rather extraordinary you know, to think that they made so much progress between 1957, the launching of Sputnik, and mm-hmm. 1969, landing a man on the moon. Let's think about that. In 12 years, you went from the first satellite mm-hmm. to putting a man on the moon. Mm-hmm. 12 years, space yeah. race in 12 years. We, we, we can't even fix HTML in 12 years. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's crazy. That was, that was so accelerated that in 1968, Stanley Kubrick very realistically thought, oh, yeah, by 2001, we'll totally have, you know, commercial... Uh, trips to the moon and a moon base and the whole thing. That was totally realistic. Yeah. And then, of course, everything just kind of ground to a halt. Yeah. They put a man on the moon, and now we can we can rest on our laurels. So it's a, it's a really interesting story, history to revisit. And then uh, equally important is a NASA-endorsed release, also from Mill Creek, uh, on 4K. This is Mill Creek's first 4K, I want to point out. Mill Creek has taken the jump into 4K with the uh, IMAX-enhanced space station. Uh, the original IMAX film with uh, Tom Cruise narrating, and uh, this is a you know this played IMAX for a long time, made a ton of money, and this is all about the uh, International Space Station and its building and how it came together, and you know yes, it is originally shot in IMAX, so it's not going to look quite the same on your 4K TV, but it's still going to look amazing. Uh, it really, really does. It's um, and that space station is so much more impressive than I think we we give it credit for, and what it has done, and how it has opened up all of yeah. our, our eyes onto the universe. It, it is it, it, it is really a funny amazing. thing though, when we talk about because we talk about the space stations, we talk about the shuttle program, yep. talk about Apollo, uh, you know, particularly you know this time of the. Um, but you know what? No one ever talks about the space undertaking. We even talk about those rovers, and you know they were yeah. amazing, all of that. Yeah. But the but the the space achievement that people don't talk about that I always found fascinating was Skylab. 
Yeah, for Nobody sure. Nobody talks about Skylab. That's true. And it, you know, and, and, and which of course was thought of a space station. And it then was of the, course it was the first one. Yeah. yeah and 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 uh, it had that thing where it, it joined up with that Russian uh, yeah Soyuz uh, Soyuz thing. Uh, that was a, a joint thing that we did not. You know, it really sort of set the tone uh, for the next twenty years. Yeah. And, uh, and I remember, I think it was in I'm gonna say I'm gonna say seventy seven. When, when, because the 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 orbit depleted, yeah. and Skylab came down mostly over Australia and some yeah. ocean or something like that. And I don't know, it just sort of went away from the zeitgeist. People forget about it. There were yeah. there were there were cartoons. It's true. That involved you know Skylab, but yeah. nobody ever mentioned Skylab anymore. And the astronauts who were on that, anyway, yeah, uh, shout true. out for Skylab. Totally, uh, absolute shout out for Skylab. Got some other docs here too. A couple of military docs. Uh, one is called Forgotten Heroes, the Robert Hartsock story. Uh, which is, uh, you know, who's Robert Hartsock? That's going to be everybody's first reaction. And uh, it, this is the this is the story of dogs in Vietnam, believe it or not. And uh, it's it's really utterly unbelievable. And it 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 sort of opens up a whole story of um, of Vietnam that I never even knew before. Did you know that there were over four thousand dogs and handlers in Vietnam? No, like military dogs. Like handlers. military dogs. Yeah, I had no idea. And it's it's absolutely extraordinary. Uh, Robert Hartsock is um, I I don't want to give it away, but Robert Hartsock is a, a significant. He received he was he was decorated with the Medal of Honor, um, because of what he something that involves dogs. That's all I'll say. And uh, it's it's pretty it's a pretty extraordinary it really it, it, it's just kind of it's you know it's a peripheral story, it's not central to the Vietnam War but it's it's still an amazing story. So uh, if you want to see a story of heroism, a story about an aspect of the Vietnam War that you had no idea even existed, by all means check it out. It's really really good. Um, got another documentary, Unforgotten: A Hero Story of of uh, War, by Darren Dick is the filmmaker. And uh, this is all about the – it's a very personal story. His grandfather was named Harold Bauer, and he was a uh, Korean War veteran. And uh, this is a, an exploration of family, an exploration of heroism, uh, really kind of delving into who his grandfather was. And, um, uh, you know, he, they, they – like they, when, he was, when he's still alive, they visit the Korean War Memorial together. And uh, it's, it's – Quite touching. I wish it were a little longer. It's only an hour long. This is from Virgil Films, um, but it's uh, it's very 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 touching. And I I am pretty sure, I I think I heard his grandfather had passed. It's possible mm -hmm. he's still around, but um, I thought I had heard that he had passed. If if he has not, I apologize for for that. But anyway, uh, Darren Dick, wonderful wonderful um, a documentary uh, about a his grandfather, a hero in the uh, in the Korean War. And then uh, some music stuff here. Uh, one other thing that's really not, before I get into it, it's not really music, but this is a, you know, we, we, we don't often get um, these unusual kind of experimental releases. Icarus has released something that for people who do like experimental film and kind of avant-garde, this is a really interesting thing. It's called uh, Minute Bodies, The Intimate World of F. Percy Smith. Mm. Uh, the documentarian here is Stuart Staples, and I, he, he is a documentarian, but um, he's also, in this case, but is, Stuart Staples is also the lead singer of a band called the Tinder Sticks. And uh, this is a tribute to another filmmaker, F. Percy Smith, that I had never heard of before, who is also kind of a, an all-around Renaissance man and um, did he, he did some very uh, aggressive pioneering work with uh, with cameras and lenses and trying to trying to to do what is much easier today with these high-speed cameras and lenses that can you know do microscopic photography and everything. And he, what he wanted to do was really push the 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 cinematographic envelope to be able to capture. Um, the world of, of amoebas and, you know, oh. microscopic stuff, right? Really, just, just really get down in there. And um, so this, this is a, a really interesting kind of musical and visual collage that is a tribute to a filmmaker from another filmmaker and a musician. And uh, it's really very interesting. It's really, really very compelling. It uh, also includes four short films that F. Percy Smith had made so that you, you get more than just what's in the film itself. And um, it's uh, this is sharp. It's on Blu-ray. It's also only about an hour long, just under. 
and it's called Minute Bodies: The Intimate World of F. Percy Smith, and uh, it'll 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 stir you and inspire you. La Fresque with choreography by uh, Angeline Preliocage, Preliocage, Angeline Preliocage, and the ballet Preliocage is uh, is from Naxos and Telmondis. This is basically a um, uh, it's called the uh, La Fresque is uh, otherwise known as the painting on the wall, which is a traditional Chinese. Uh, story that has been interpreted here as kind of modern ballet. Very, very nicely done. Um, great choreography. It's a little bit uh, ballet, a little bit modern dance, but it's really, really cool. And that's on Blu-ray. We also have the opera Giulietta Romeo by Nicola Vacage. Uh, or Nicola, I forget. You pronounce it one way for a man, one way for a woman. I'm never quite clear on that. Mm. Uh, this is from Dynamic and Naxos. Uh, not an opera I've ever heard of. It's, uh, it's you know, a two-act tragedy. But it the music's nice, singing's nice, fair enough. This was uh, recorded in 2018, so the uh, audio is absolutely superb. Uh, also, um, uh, La Passion Selon Marc, which is a um, very, very... This is from Bel Air. This is on Blu-ray. Uh, this is a... Oh, how would I put this? It is, um, it's, it is a religious... It's almost like a liturgical... Memorial uh, to Auschwitz, if that even makes sense. But mm. it's it's it was written in memory, obviously, of those who perished in Auschwitz and in the uh, in the Holocaust. Um, and it uh, it it's a it was performed in April of 2017. Uh, originally made for Swiss television, and uh, it is a it is a lovely, lovely, lovely uh, composition, and um, you know carries a carries a real kind of very heavy-handed uh, historical memory with it. This is performed by the uh, Chamber Orchestra and Vocal Ensemble of Lausanne in Switzerland, where I once lived. So it's uh, it's very personal to me as well. And it uh, comes in a very nice white keep case, which uh, is in keeping sort of with the redemptive quality of the thing. And then lastly, on the music front, CMA Awards Live. We've done a number of these in the past. This is the greatest moments from 1968 to 2015. Uh... I'm, you know, country music. I sometimes have, I'm in the mood for Garth Brooks once in a while. Why mm-hmm. not? Who mm-hmm. isn't? Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I don't really watch the CMAs. It's not a thing that I do. And so uh, putting it all together here in a, uh, in a 10 DVD set, you realize there's a lot of great country music out there, and I kind of feel like I've been missing out a little bit. Uh, but, yeah, this is, uh, this is from 1968 all the way to just four years ago. Covers the entire history of country music. It's not even really about the CMAs. It's about everybody. And they, uh, Merle Haggard performs here. Um, Alabama, which is something I grew up on. Chris Christopherson. Right up to stuff like Lady Antebellum. And, mm. and uh, you know, there's even some great Glenn Campbell stuff here. It really, this is, did you know that Julio Iglesias sang at the CMA? No. Isn't that weird? Yeah, I can't imagine why <laughs> Julio Iglesias sang at the CMA. Eventually, well, everybody well, goes to country. Yeah. Tell him to Oz. Yeah. Everybody goes to country eventually. Remember, he did a duet with Willie Nelson. Yes, of course. Yeah, that, yeah. That, 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 that's the cred. <laughs> that, that's the cred right there. That's the yeah, cred. Yeah, yeah. That's the crazy. Cred. So CMA Awards Live, always, a, always a, a musical surprise, a much more diverse uh, collection of performances than you would ever really expect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, All right. A few newbies? Yeah, let's do some new movies. Uh, Hellboy. You know, um, I the, the, like this Hellboy and I defend it. You defend it? The, the, the reboot it. did not do very well. I know it tanked. Uh, uh, it, it, it tanked pretty bad. Yeah. Although I love, Dave, I love David Harbour's casting. That That's I Hellboy from Stranger, yeah. uh, Stranger, Stranger Things. Things. Uh, that was the best part of this Hellboy. In any, in any case, didn't do that well, but I imagine fans are going to be fans. Yeah. Uh, uh, anyway, you, you got everything here. The, uh, the Ultra HD, you got your Blu-ray, you got your DVD uh, on this fairly nice pack. Package, which includes uh, Tales of the Wild Hunt, Hellboy Reborn, a three-part documentary with yeah. a lot of things, all kinds of neat stuff there. So if you're a fan, you're going to be a fan uh, of the Hellboy. Why do you think it didn't do, do so well? So I think a number of things. Uh, because a lot of people love Guillermo... I mean, look, everyone loves Guillermo del Toro. Yeah. Uh, and the first two were both del Toro films, and he was prepared to do a third. And I think a lot of people had themselves wrapped around a trilogy. Mm. And then it didn't happen, and it turned into a reboot instead. And they stuck David Harbour in there uh, to to take over the part, which a lot, I think, and a lot of people felt that you know Ron Perlman owned that part and should have been there. He aged out of it. He did age out of it. Yeah. And and the thing is, uh, look, uh, Hellboy is never going to be a long standing franchise. You're, you're not going to. I think it's a mistake to think you can squeeze ten or twelve Hellboy movies out. You can't. Yeah. Hellboy is is a very limited thing. So. 
I kind of felt like the whole Hellboy idea had played out in two films. I thought the second one was really, really stretched pretty thin. And I was over it. And I was like, okay, we've done Hellboy for the movies. Goodbye. So I was skeptical about, oh, really, you're going to reboot that? What are you possibly going to do with Hellboy that you didn't do the first two times? What could you possibly do? <laughs> well, what they did was they made it R-rated. And they made it, uh, they made it campier. They went, they went further and farther with it. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a little gorier. Mm. It's a little meaner. Mm. And it's, I, I felt like it's more in, more in a, in a, in a vein that I appreciate it. I appreciate the really dark humor. Which was, I suppose, more akin to the actual uh, yeah, to the, to the, to the graphic, graphic novel. novel in the first yeah. place. It was, you know, all of those things are a little bit darker than the yeah, fiction. So, so, so from that standpoint, I thought, all right, to- I, good. I, I'm, I'm, I'm down with that. And um, uh, so I appreciate that. Do I think they can squeeze another one out of it? Well, no. Even if it had been successful, I, I think you're still stretching it. But I appreciate I appreciated that they they went for it a little bit, as opposed to just trying to rehash the thing. So I thought there was some risk involved. Didn't pan out, but I respect what they were doing. The origin story is a little bit different in in this this Hellboy than it had been in the other one, too. Uh, Ugly Dolls, man, star-studded cast in this, voices from everywhere. Um, It's a cute little film, I thought. A little frenetic for me. Uh, Insanely colorful. I mean, the the colors just popped off the screen from this animation. Uh, Here you got Kelly Clarkson. uh, You got Nick Jonas. You got Janelle Monet. You got Blake Shelton. uh, You got Pitbull. You got Wanda Sykes. uh, And Gabrielle Iglesias, speaking of the the Iglesias's. Uh, everybody's singing and dancing and jumping around. Basically, it's a story about this little, little little town called Uglyville, where all the dolls are, are, are you know, not attractive, not perfect. Uh, two heads, one eye, all that kind of wacky stuff. They discover a place called Perfection, uh, where everyone is perfect. Uh, and th- ultimately, it's about how I suppose you yeah. don't have to be perfect in the world to still be <laughs> valuable. Considering you and I both wear, wear glasses, yeah, I guess we know that, how that goes. This is cute. This is the sing along edition. Uh, so you know, I don't know. Um, 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 what what age range do you think? I mean, I mean, I know what they say on this. But what do you think? Uh, would know. hero would hero tap into this? Yeah, maybe a little, but not too much. She likes Jack Jack more these days. Jack Jack's she's back, in her, she's back on a Jack Jack kick. A little bit more um, action. Yeah, no, up to eight. Eight. Yeah. Tops. Yeah. What's yeah. it say? What's the what's recommended? Uh, it says between like, between yeah between six and about eight. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Uh, bonus features: the making of ugly dolls, fun with the cast, and like again, it's this yeah. sing along version of it. So you know, you can have some fun. Fair enough. But doing that one, uh, Project Ithaca was a fairly interesting conceived science fiction, uh, little science fiction movie here that I kind of dug the theme of anyway. The idea is that there are these uh, uh, terrible aliens, malevolent right. aliens have been just abducting people for years and years and years and years, maybe even centuries, right? Uh, what they want to do is harvest uh, human energy. Ew. And then they're going to use it to open a wormhole, pass through the wormhole and take over the world. Hey, look, it's a classic classic storyline. <laughs> uh, uh, the scientists create a human alien hybrid, mm-hmm. and they send her through the wormhole to you know, inject her human stuff okay. <laughs> on the other side. It's going to jack them all up. That's a classic story. This is mostly just a movie that they shot on a set with, a set with some fairly decent yeah. special effects. That's all that's going on here. But you know what? Kind of work. Yeah, good fun props to them. Fun, fun for me. Props to them. This em. is just a DVD. Not much going on otherwise. Yeah, let me there. hit some kid vid here. Um, got a couple from Sesame Street. Awesome alphabet collection. I know every adult listening is like, oh yeah, that could be <laughs> into that. Uh, this is just three shows helping kids learn their alphabets, uh, and it's fine. You know, you got Elmo and Abby and all the usual things. It's fine. Uh, the, the guest stars here are the ones that'll keep the adults from actually throwing things at the television. Uh, Nora Jones and Cheryl Crow and Farrell Williams and Maya Angelou comes by and gives you know. Some hugs. Oh. Uh, it's really sweet. It's it, Ricky Gervais somehow is appropriate for Sesame Street. I'm not quite sure, you know. <laughs> I, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> but and then uh, and then uh, on a lighter note, dance party, which is it, which really has no educational value to it whatsoever. It's just a lot of dancing. But um, it's a lot of dancing with Elmo, basically. <laughs> but again, it's about the guest the guest appearances here: Naomi Watts and Leah Schreiber and uh, and and Jason Derulo and Janelle Monae, and it's it's a lot of fun. So uh, you know, if you, Sesame Street continues to milk their uh, their stuff pretty well, PBS is where you get the better educational stuff. Ready, Jet, Go. Mm-hmm. Not a, not a show that uh, particularly respond that my, my daughter particularly responds to, but it's got a little sci fi element to it, and it's uh, they got three. Uh, Three very Apollo timely episodes on this one, uh, which is called One Small Step. 
Uh, and and if you're trying to teach kids about you know moon landing in space, this is this is good. Uh, there's some there's some good stuff here. Um, also, Arthur celebrates community, the longstanding Arthur thing. I still don't really know what animal Arthur is. I can never really tell what animals any of them are in Arthur. But uh, Arthur has some good uh, educational stuff to it as well. And uh, there are eight stories here, including uh, Binky Can't Always Get What He Wants, which is a, is a hysterical line, but it's actually a really good show. It's very, very, that's good. So I just think Binky, partly what makes me laugh is a friend of mine uh, refers to um, uh, Facebook as, as, well, he refers basically to, uh, Binky is his nickname for everything that goes on on Facebook. Anything goes wrong, he blames Binky. Uh, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, also very sweet. This is Won't You Be Our Neighbor. And this is uh, five stories from the uh, the Daniel Tiger line. It's nicely animated. It's very warm, very storybook looking. And then uh, the last one, uh, which I like the best, is uh, Splash and Bubbles. You can never do wrong with fish, or yeah. as far as I'm concerned, whether it's Nemo and Dory or the Bubble Guppies, anything to do with fish and underwater, I'm, I'm down with, as long as it's not the Aquaman movie. This is six episodes from uh, Splash and Bubbles under the title The Kelp Forest. And a uh, really sweet couple of, couple of fish. Very nicely animated. Good CGI animation from, uh, from PBS Kids. And then the last two kid vids are, uh, kid vid titles are from Nickelodeon. Uh, and uh, the first one is Paw Patrol, Jungle Rescues. Boys love Paw Patrol. My daughter, other girls don't really get into it quite so much. But there are seven adventures here. And uh, the Paw Patrol are uh, basically looking to figure out the mystery of the Monkey Queen and, uh, and a few other things. And it, it gets a little far-fetched, but you know what? Boys love it. And uh, then lastly, Butterbeans Cafe is a new Nickelodeon series. And uh, this includes seven stories from Butterbeans Cafe. I, I'm, I actually kind of like this. My daughter is not into it. Yet, but I could see her getting into it mm. because as I left today, she was cooking with mommy and really started. And this is kind of her first real cooking experience, making buttery pancakes and really enjoying it. So I think that she will eventually learn to enjoy this. This is basically culinary fairies is the only way that I could put it. Um, Butterbeans Cafe, culinary fairies, very, cle- very clever, very sweet. And um, actually surprisingly well-written. So uh, check out Butterbeans Cafe. Uh, this uh, is the very, very first DVD release for that new Nickelodeon series. Um, uh, a couple of more newbies. I, th- I thought this film would have d- done better than it did. I remember talking about it on the radio show. The Long Shot, um, uh, Seth Rogen and Charlize Theron in this movie. They had chemistry in this film, which completely surprised me. Yeah. Uh, that they actually like, had this sort of oddball chemistry. She was incredibly funny in the film. Basically, she's playing on a woman yeah. who's a, a presidential candidate. She hires this guy, Fred Flarsky, which is such a <laughs> Seth, <laughs> Seth Rogen character name. This is Seth and Evan Goldberg writing here. So, yeah. I- and, and, and he turns out to have been uh, someone she babysitted no. uh, when you know he was about ten and she was about thirteen. Oh, that's getting uh, a little and twisted. He, and then had a little weird crush on her and all this uh, kind of okay. stuff. You know, flash forward thirty years, and that's all, all plays back into the story that's going on. It's a little political. It's a little sharp. Uh, one of the mistakes that it makes is that it only pokes fun at the conservative side. Yeah, well, uh, that's, that's always a mistake. As a matter of fact, let me tell you what you want to do if you're going to make one of these movies, particularly if you happen to be kind of liberal, progressive, whatever. Poke fun at yourself. Yeah. Poke fun at your side. Uh, primary colors. Okay. Uh, you know, good th- point. That, 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 that's funny. Uh, yeah. and, and, but, it's, but they're taking down their own side. Yeah. L- l- the other side will be you know, ridiculous by comparison, but that's what you want to do. You don't want to poke fun at the other side. That's, that's easy. It's easy to take pot shots, but nobody can shoot back. My favorite, now that you mentioned it, my favorite line in primary colors is that rant by Billy Bob Thornton about how he's more black. He's so black he can taste it. Right? How that line goes. That is just an absolutely brilliant line and so well delivered. Ah, you know you what? Remember that line? Yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> hey, what's, what's, you can't write that line anymore. No, you can't. Now you're going to get a note from the studio. <laughs> write that line, you're going to get a note from the studio. Anyway, the long shot, a Blu-ray, DVD, and digital uh, with all kinds of neat stuff in terms of uh, special features, too. So if you didn't see it in theaters, give it a shot anyway. It's still funny. I mean, I'm poking at it now, but it's actually a very funny movie, and, and Charlize and Seth have a great deal of chemistry together. Shazam! Uh, this, was, this was an interesting thing to me because, you know, you had Captain Marvel earlier in the year and then Shazam right after it, right? Now, you and I both know we go back long enough to remember when they, they were the same person. 
Right. When totally. Shazam was something that Billy said to turn himself into Captain Marvel. That's yes. And and, and then there was this whole thing with comic books. Well, and they went, Sh- Shazam, you know, you know Shazam stood. They they reinterpreted it so that each letter stood for a different one of the elders. Yeah. Right. They like there was a Saturn and Hercules yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Zeus and Athena, and it was they, each letter stood for somebody and uh, Achilles. Yeah. Achilles was in there. Achilles, Zeus, Athena, and uh, whoever the, the M was. But yeah. Um, Boy, it's how, complicated the, the how these books. It had to do with a with, with a comic book that went out of business a long yeah. time ago, and then the but the characters got bought by the other side, and they took them and split them up. And it's a it's stuff, a, you know? I, I still think that DC should have just disobeyed, the, just take the fine and just say we're going to keep calling it Captain Marvel. Yeah, you know because you have a Captain Marvel, we got a Captain Marvel. There can be two Captain Marvels. Yeah, maybe anyway. that, that all said, this was funny. It's uh, a fun this, film. This film cracked me up. Uh, it's not. It's not film. faithful in any no, way. No, in any way to anything. It's, yeah. it's basically big. It's big with with superpowers. Yeah, yeah. But um, it's uh, still Jack fun. Dylan uh, uh, Grazier uh, playing it. So anyway, yeah. it's a lot of fun. This movie, um, all kinds of stuff on this DVD. Uh, Ninety minutes worth of uh, fancy new stuff. But the movie itself is just pretty pretty damn funny. So so check it out. Uh, everything Blu-ray, digital, DVD. Uh, with that, 4K uh, and 4K. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, little. Um, which was a cute little film that came out early it's, in the year. No one paid attention. No to one this. paid any attention to it, which was unfortunate. Regina yeah. Hall, uh, who was so funny and uh, uh, support the girls, uh, and, and really proved the chops. Basically, this too is kind of a big smash uh, up with uh, Freaky Friday kind of thing. You got this uh, uh, this 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 little girl when we meet her, and, and and she's bullied in school, and she grows up to be Regina Hall, a real sort of an a hole of a boss at this company, uh, and she has uh, Issa Rae working for her, who is funny in this movie, uh, uh, and then and then she is turned into this little girl, uh, and she spends the rest of the movie. There's a weird motif in this movie that freaked me out that I did not care for, because she is in fact an adult inside the body of a little girl. You know, Regina Hall inside the body of this little girl. She still has all of the desires and interests of an adult woman, and uh, which include these really fine brothers walking around this movie. Now, yeah. here's the problem. That's still a little girl, and she's, like, jonesing on these really, yeah. really fine dudes and, yeah. like, saying things and moving around. And I'm like, you know what? This is not – I'm not comfortable. <laughs> I'm, I'm not comfortable. <laughs> I'm not comfortable with any of this. But those jokes are all in the movie. And they're funny, yeah. But no, <laughs> no, D- don't care for those jokes. With all kinds of bonus features on this, including a gag reel. It's a funny, it's a funny movie. But that was just sort of weird. All right, uh, Body at Brighton Rock. Body at Brighton Rock. Body at Brighton Rock. I'm going to tell you right now. I had to review that for film for Film Week. Uh, you know what? Um, we had a bit of disagreement on Film Week uh, over it. Who, who are you? Who are you with? I think it was on with Christy. I think uh, Christy liked it. Let me anyway. Hear. Um, it, no, it, it's it's a super low budget movie. Uh, it takes place in a in a national park about a a ranger girl who uh, goes. She's a bit nerdy and she's on her patrol and she goes off and finds a body and um, winds up being kind of stranded and stuck with this body until people can arrive and then weird things happen that don't make sense. And I kid you not, when the when the thing ends, they try to do some kind of an M. Night shyamalan twisty thing at the end, and it's so bad <laughs> that it that, – that it, 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 because truly, it makes no sense. Like, normally the twist makes you go, oh, oh no, yeah. I get it. This twist makes you go, wait, what? <laughs> and then the movie ends. <gasps> and, I'm, and, and to this day, I have no idea what's going on at the end of this movie. It's very frustrating. Mm. Um I, I, I give them props. You made it. You went out into the mountains with a film crew, and you made a movie, a feature film. You got it released. You got it on the Blu-ray. I still don't know what your movie means. Yeah, little girl power I, I no kind idea. of thing, I think, is what's going on in yeah, this movie. Yeah, a little yeah. bit. Tom but... Derrick, Roxanne Benjamin, the director of this movie, directed a couple of other thrillers. So, you know. Uh, makes no sense. Uh, but but, but, it, but in, in fact, film makes, makes no, no sense. Uh, Body at Bride and Rock. Not a lot Freaking. of, a few special uh, features, including a commentary with the director. Which Doug's does not explain anything. What's going on in the movie? No, it does not explain anything. <laughs> it doesn't explain anything. I need more. Uh. Doug's hot dog movie. Uh, it says on the back of this. This is a. It's, it's a. It's a. It's a doc about this. Uh, about this hot dog joint. Uh, named by Anthony Bourdain as one of the thirteen places you must eat before you die. 
uh, which is a little ironic that Sweet. he said that, but he but he ate and then he died. <laughs> uh, so it, apparently he got it right. Anyway, it's a, it's a, a fairly cute movie where we uh, we meet this guy Doug who is, has this particular affection for hot dogs and opens up this hot dog stand and all the customers who come there yeah. and, and why they love it and what they love about hot dogs. It's just a goofy movie about uh, you know hot dogs. Um, uh, I I'm like getting hot dogs, hungry. but I don't think I need. I'm to hungry. I'll see a whole movie about it. Uh, nevertheless, funny. If you want to do that kind of thing, Serenity. You remember when we saw this oh, movie? I do. We saw it, do it together, oh. and I think we have the same reaction to yeah. it, which is um, it's a mess. It's a mess. Yeah, and it Matthew McConaughey and Hathaway. It's an ambitious mess. Yeah, though. I mean, it really, really, uh, it's very, it very self consciously tries to spin. A fascinating kind of Hitchcockian thriller mm, slash um, noir. It's a no, it's a little noir, a little Hitchcock. Yeah, it, it's sort of you know, uh, but but ultimately, it's too coy about what it's not telling you, yeah, and what it's not showing you, yeah, and what it's hiding, and uh, that bec- and, and by the time it sort of, sort of tries to hit you with an uppercut at the end, it just doesn't have it. It's, it hasn't earned it. Yeah, it, it, two easy fixes in this movie too. I mean, we talked about it. There were two easy fixes. I'm not going to say what they are because they'll be obvious when you when you see the movie. One of them would have to do with getting rid of the, the sort of sci-fi thing that's going on yeah. in, in the movie. Just get rid yeah. of all that together and just tell this story. Yeah, just tell the story. A little boy, this woman, her husband, you know, yeah. femme fatale, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, and it, it all works out yeah. the way it works out. You didn't really need any of that sort of hitty kind of stuff yeah. going on in it. Uh, and then I like a, I yeah. like the, tr- the the sort of uh, the island setting of it. That's yeah. that's the one thing I like that Matthew McConaughey and the boats and the tropics and a bit of know. a Truman Showish kind of thing going yeah, on. Yeah, I, 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 I like yeah I like the kind of Caribbean ish. Um, the South Pacific island setting that was that was nice. It made me feel like it was a little bit of Magnum PI going on. And if you're going to do Magnum PI, you, you should probably cast Matthew McConaughey as the yeah. new Magnum PI. Yeah, for, yeah. For, for, for for a film. For a film, anyway. Yeah. Uh, not surprised, but not not a whole lot of uh, special features on that yeah. one. Yeah. Great cast know. though. Uh, you, Jason Clark, Jean Van Hunter, Diane totally. Lane. I mean, you know, yeah. you, you build a movie with a cast like that. You you hope. You know. you, you you're you're, you're yeah. It's. It's unfortunate. Sometimes the cast will not save you. Another one that didn't do as well as folks had thought it might or anticipated it would be was Alita Battle Angel. Yeah, a little dent on the uh, James Cameron uh, cred there. Yeah. Yes, yeah, he didn't from, direct it. You know, but producers of Avatar, but he yeah. didn't direct it. Yeah. Um, uh, look, it's a, as an action sort of – the problem here is you have you know live action combined with this particular character that is the sort of live action slash uh, CGI created character. Um, uh, and she can, you know, she's a leader. She's a badass. She can do all this kind of stuff. It's a you know, great ad- ad- adventure about a cyborg. But those it just didn't mesh for me. She, that character, was never in the room, in the scene True. with those humans. Yeah. Uh, never. Yeah. Uh, and and I'm, I'm watching this, and I'm just like, you're not there. You're the one who's not there, and, it's just, and, and, and you never will be there. The only way to be there is to actually be there. And I don't know. I, I just I'm never going to fall for this stuff. I just don't think it's 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 meant for me. Anyway, this is dense with over two hours worth of all kinds of special features uh, that folks who are you know a fan of the of, of not just the genre but the character will enjoy. But it did not work for me. Blu-ray, DVD, digital, whole shebang. One um, over there. Yeah, let me let me hit a, a few a uh, few Asian titles here. Some got some good foreign language Asian titles here. First one is Master Z Ip Man Legacy yeah. with uh, Max Zhang, Dave Bautista Dave. making the trip over to yeah. uh, to China to to show up and make a little cameo here. Michelle Yeoh and Tony Jaa, amazing yeah. cast. Yeah, that's a that's a great cast directed by Yun Wu Ping. Amazing, brilliant Yun Wu Ping, who, of course, you know, uh, launched Jackie Chan's career mm-hmm. originally with the original Drunken Master and choreographed everything from The Matrix to the Kill Bill films. Anyway, so Yun Wu Ping, uh, who has worked with Michelle Yeoh previously and uh, directed her in the uh, the Tai Chi Master with Jet Li, a lot of other great stuff. So Yun Wu Ping directs the daylights out of this thing. The fighting is fantastic. It's great. It's brilliant. Dave Bautista is perfectly cast. If you if you would imagine if Dave Bautista weren't in this, like if anyone else had made this story, they would have put Mike Tyson in there. Yeah, but we no we we get we don't have Mike Tyson in here. Yeah, we got Dave Bautista. Yeah, and yeah. that's better casting. Yeah, he's yeah. not as good a fighter as Mike Tyson. Yeah, but he's a better actor. Better actor. Yeah, and that's, yeah. Mike and, is fun to look at, but he never could act. Yeah, but uh, anyway, basically this is a spinoff from the Ip Man films. Uh, a guy who's been defeated by Ip Man, played by Max Zhang, plays uh, Chung Tin Chi. 
uh, he goes to kind of restart his life, and you know, it's the usual thing. They pull. He was trying to live a peaceful life, and they pull him back in. He's got to fight again. It's the usual. But Michelle Yeoh is wonderful. Dave Bautista is wonderful. Uh, Tony Jaa is great. Not a great actor, but an amazing physical presence. And Max Zhang is just surrounded by so many great people. All he has to do is just stay, you know, stay at everybody else's level, and it's all great. Really fun film. That's from uh, Wellgo. It includes a dub track in it, which you should not not watch. Has some behind the scenes stuff and trailers, but otherwise, terrific Blu-ray. Uh, going a little bit back further in martial arts history is uh, Taiwanese director, the legendary Taiwanese director King Hu, made one of his best films with the fate of Lee Khan. Uh, and this is from Film Movement Classics. It is a wonderful welcome release from Film Movement Classics. I am so thrilled that they uh, they're, they're doing this. They they licensed this from Fortune Star over in uh, in Hong Kong, and what a great transfer! It's colorful, it's bright. King Hu's movies always felt like a um, to me at least felt like the like John Ford movies of Asia. Yeah, they have the same widescreen quality, the same sort of epic uh, tapestry, the, the 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 color, the quality of the color. It's really really great, and this is also one of the um, earliest and most famous. Uh, female like empowerment kung fu films, and it's an all it's a, it, I mean it is a it is a powerful uh, female cast. He's had you've had strong f- women in these films in the past, but in this one, you got Lily Hua, uh, Angela Mao. It's and you know all takes it's basically you know a, a western in the sense that the the dynasty is oppressive and they're fighting the the dynastic powers of the Yuan dynasty. But it is, um, you know, rebels versus whatever. But everything here was um, choreographed by Sammo Hung when he was just starting out as well, when Mm -hmm. he and Jackie Chan were starting out, before he had really made a name for himself. And it is absolutely terrific. Um, Wonderful Joseph Koo music. If you're a fan of this genre, this is one of the all-time classics. Can't recommend it highly enough. Really, really great. Also includes a, um, a discussion from the the, uh, New York Asian Film Festival and an essay by Stephen Tao. Uh, and then uh, a few others here. Let's see. We've got more recent film, The Swindlers. Uh, this is also from Wellgo. The Swindlers is a uh, pretty straightforward crime story, um, a little bit in the vein of Infernal Affairs. Uh, not obviously not as good as Infernal Affairs, but uh, you know it's it's all about kind of trying to how to trap a con man and a team that has to come together to uh, to take down a notorious con man. Some really really good performances here. Solid film, not brilliant, but solid. Um, similarly good is The Island. The Island is a, a little bit wackier, a little funnier. Um, it, it's the kind of film that I usually don't necessarily like because it's uh, it's one of these new generation of big budget uh, kind of dunderheaded um, Chinese epics that are they're just trying to copy big budget things from Hollywood. Um, but that said, there's some they play this tongue in cheek enough that you can sort of laugh at it. So as long as they're not playing it straight, you can enjoy this and. I guess you could say it splits a difference somewhere between Indiana Jones and The Hangover, ah. uh, which I know sounds weird, but uh, you know it, it, it's it's silly, it's uh, adventurous, it uh, it involves a meteorite that may strike the Earth, it involves uh, you know possibly winning the lottery uh, and a whole bunch of stuff that really doesn't belong in the same movie, and yet somehow it all kind of uh, plays out in a in a rather silly way. Uh, so it's the island. Shu K is in it, which is maybe why I like it so much because I can't really I'm I'm incapable of liking disliking anything that Shu K is in. All the rest of the guys, I'm, I can take them or leave them. And the last one is an absolutely brilliant movie. Uh, I am very sad that this didn't get more play here. It is a uh, Cohen Cohen Media Group's Blu-ray release of Ash is the Purest White, yeah. the new film from uh, Jia Zhang Ke, to whom we gave the uh, LAFCA Award for Best Foreign Language Film a few years ago for yeah. uh, A Touch of Sin. Uh, Gia is probably the, the of his generation, he's the first real artist uh, to emerge from Chinese independent cinema since Zhang Yimao and Shen Kaiga and the, the directors of the fifth generation. Uh, this is an absolutely devastating, powerful, powerful movie. Um, it's it's you know over two hours as most of his, his films are, and um, it it centers around a um, an unfortunate crime 
that is an act of uh, devotion and loyalty and the punishment that ensues and um, what dovetails afterwards. And I wouldn't call it a revenge story. It is a story about, as most of Zhang Zhuko's movies are, it's a story about bureaucracy in China, the price of a uh, a society that has perhaps lost its moral bearings. Mm. And I will, that's what I will say about it. It is a really powerful film. Uh, not, obviously not as ambitious as something like A Touch of Sin, but certainly um, not not far away. So that is uh, Ash is the Purest White. Definitely check that out on Blu-ray. Ah, uh, a few more over here. Yeah. Uh, so so this this is this is a movie called called Run, which is uh, slightly interesting. Uh, Josiah uh, David Warren directed this movie. Um, so it's about this guy, young businessman, marries a young woman. Uh, who's a reporter on human trafficking, young beautiful woman, yeah. uh, uh, played by Taylor Murphy. Now, she she goes and does this investigation of this sort of sex trafficking organization, uh, and it doesn't occur to her that as a young beautiful woman, this might not be a good idea. <laughs> That's what happens. She gets kidnapped, and, and it's in the process of being sold into human slavery because you know what sex traffickers are assholes. The, the hit yeah. guy here is played by Stephen Baldwin. I think all the Baldwins can only play villains now. Isn't that funny? Yeah. So you had Billy. A Baldwin, you had you know Alec, obviously, yeah. uh, and this is Stephen Baldwin. At a, there was a point, middle nineties, early nineties, middle nineties, when there were all these handsome young leading men who played heroes, and now they they they're not, <laughs> and, and they all play bad guys. That's they just they, 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 that's all they play in movies. That now, is really guys. interesting. Uh, anyway, I this, thought of that. this is a, this is a this is a this is a fairly decent movie. What's weird about it, also, given the subject matter, is that it's approved by Dove, the the Dove organization, oh, yeah, yeah. who usually sort of give their stamp. Of approval to these sort movies of about kids and animals, kids and animals, maybe some uh, quasi faith based kind of yeah. stuff. And I'm thinking, they looked at this movie about human <laughs> sex trafficking it, with Billy Baldwin playing this absolutely atrocious guy, and thought, yeah, this is one of ours for the family. Right. And I'm like, I don't, I don't think so. Nevertheless, <laughs> run uh, approved by the Dove organization. They got it. Trace Atkins is in two movies that I have in hand here. One is called Wild uh, Faith, which is a little bit interesting, set right after the Civil War. But mostly in the state of Michigan, we think about the war, we think about the South all the time. This is about uh, a soldier, Union soldier, uh, just at the end of the war, wants to go back home to Michigan, but he made this promise to this black soldier, black Union soldier, uh, to take care of his family, to bring his family out of the South to come live with him in Michigan. So, the, so he does, you know, and it, it turns out to be a more arduous thing than you would think because in Michigan, uh, this black woman with her son and this white uh, 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 um, Civil War veteran are still not are still not uh, going down that well. So, but an interesting setting about with an interesting story, featuring Trace Atkins. So we bump over to The Outsider, uh-huh. uh, which is a film that stars Trace Atkins. Now Trace <laughs> Atkins is, is, is a country singer, but I'm thinking not anymore. Yeah. I'm thinking because you know you see Trace on lots of stuff, sure. Because he has that voice, sounds like yeah. Leghorn far. Yeah. Uh, so he, he's just putting that to work now. I think Trace is actually a cowboy actor. Nevertheless, uh, here here again we have this sort of interesting, uh, interesting movie about revenge. Uh, small town. Uh, he plays uh, uh, he plays the sheriff or the marshal, technically speaking. Is trying to control this small town where everybody's corrupt and doing all sorts of terrible things. You got Sean Patrick Flannery here. You got Danny Trejo here. If you're ever wondering what these guys are doing uh, when Danny's not selling tacos all around town, <laughs> vegetarian, vegetarian, ta- vegan tacos, tacos. vegan tacos. Yeah. You go, Danny, really? Yeah. Mm, okay, if he says so. <laughs> uh, you, you wonder where these guys go. This is where they go. They go and they make movies like this. This is actually an okay little film. Not fantastic, but if you're into sort of, uh, you know, uh, funky westerns with a lot of shootouts and stuff like that, this will get you over the which, hump. Which there's some of that in uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, too. Exactly. I want him to look like a hippie. <laughs> when he comes out with that. Yeah. Uh, you, know, uh, you know who that was playing uh, Sam Wanamaker? Oh, uh, who was that? That was, that was uh, Nicholas Hammond. Oh really? That was I know. It took me a minute too. So yeah, the d- director Sam Wanamaker. With the hair. Yeah. He looked just like Wanamaker. I I I, I, uh, I I Sam Wanamaker director Sam Wanamaker in uh, in Once Upon a Time in uh, in uh, Hollywood comes in working with uh, and I'm like I, why do I know that guy? How do I know? And then it took me a minute. I'm like holy cow! It's Nicholas Hammond from Sound of Music and Spider Man. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> That's so funny. Great so casting. Funny. Great casting. Man, well, the casting of that movie, except for, and we're going on a little aside yeah. here, um, Damien, uh, Damien Lewis, I think it was, who was played Steve McQueen for that few seconds. Yeah. Not right. 
you know. He, he's older than Steve McQueen is when now. He's yeah. older now than Steve yeah. McQueen was when he died. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, here's the funny thing. A lot of people have been posting pictures of Damien Lewis mm-hmm. with a picture of a young Steve McQueen. And it may actually be the only picture ever taken of Steve McQueen where he looks like Damian Lewis. <laughs> it has to be. Because they, they, they're they bending over backwards to find the one. Yeah. So like, oh, look, don't they look a lot alike? Yeah, that I'm day. Thinking, that, yeah, that day. <laughs> <laughs> but at no other time in either one of their careers. Uh, has a funny line in that yeah. movie, though. The funny, yeah. funny line in that movie. You, 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 so plainly, uh, uh, Sharon Tate's like, uh, likes little men who look like 12-year-old yeah. boys. And, and Damian Lewis, Steve McQueen says, I never had a shot. Yeah. <laughs> that was hysterical. Movie. So many wonderful little jokes in that movie. Uh. Breakthrough, uh, which is loosely based on a true story, a sort of quasi-faith-based film uh, about a little boy uh, uh, who drowns in a lake and his yeah. mother prays for him to, uh, to come back from the breath of death and, uh, and, and, you know, and the miracle happens and all of that. Um, all fine. A lovely little movie uh, put together nice, nicely. Josh Lucas, Topher Grace, Mike Coulter in the, in, in the film, Dennis Haysburg in the film. More, more, most interestingly, it's directed by Roxanne Dawson. Uh, Roxanne Dawson played Belana Torres on the Star Trek. Well, you know, played lots of wonderful actress from way back in the day, but she played Belana Torres uh, on the, what was it? I guess that would have been Voyager um, uh, that she was on back there. So uh, interesting that she has really, go look her up. She has a really wonderful career, Roxanne, uh, after all those years on television as a director. And I just, you know, I just want to point out uh, that there, uh, there, there's a track uh, for these for these folks to take, um, for women to take, and they're sort of establishing themselves very solidly doing this thing. So this is a nice little inspiring film for the whole family. Um, bugged me a little bit. This movie, the mom in this movie, uh, who's playing, who's being uh, played by Chrissy uh, Chrissy Metz. Yeah, uh, she was kind of irritating. <laughs> you know, <laughs> totally. the, the character that yeah. she's playing was yeah. irritating. You know, yeah. and, 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 and her and I'm like, yeah. you know, I, I get what you're doing here for your boy and all that kind of stuff, but you know what? You're being a little bitchy. So this next one you, you, that you just pulled nah, out, Missing Link. Now let me tell you something about Missing Link. This is why this is funny, uh, because uh, uh, I have a friend staying with me right now. Uh, SIGGRAPH is going on right now at the LA Convention Center. Nah. SIGGRAPH is a is a whole digital <laughs> digital Hollywood kind of digi- digital everything. It's yeah. Sig- anyway, so a friend of mine is staying with me, uh, who is a CG amazing CGI artist. He was one of the guys who animated Gollum. Ah. He lived. He lived in New Zealand. Worked for Weta for years on on Lord of the Rings films and on King Kong. Uh, did he did stuff for uh, for uh, Rhythm and Hughes? In any case, he's working for Leica right now, mm-hmm. and he worked on this. Oh, really? Every Bert he animate. Now this is now mind you, Leica is a stop motion company. Yeah, but they have a digital wing. And he was telling me just last night, we're just sitting there just talking, and, and he's like, oh, yeah, I am. every bird in Missing Link is mine. <laughs> every bird. He did every bird in Missing Link. That's funny. That's yeah. funny. I, you know, a decent movie. Did okay. Uh, Hugh Jackman, Zoe uh, Saldana. It was released Zach by Annapurna. That was the problem. Yeah, Annapurna didn't, didn't, didn't know the marketing. Didn't, didn't, didn't know understand how to the marketing it. for yeah. it. I, I, I think Hugh Jackman plays this adventurer who goes out on these fantastic. He's funny as heck. Yeah. And the character is funny, yes. and he is funny as the character. Uh, Zoe Saldana is sort of a, a death defying assistant. And then Zach playing this quote unquote missing link, which is why it's funny because people look at the, uh, when they would look at this artwork of that, that particular character. And they would be like, "Yeah, what is he? A gorilla? Is he?" A, yeah. I'm like, "No, he's not a gorilla. If he were a gorilla, he wouldn't be a missing link." He's l- exactly, it's, it's, he is a missing link. He, he can't be anything that we know, yeah. which is why he doesn't look like anything that we know. Uh, that's thus the title. But you know what? Some people are dense. Nevertheless, yeah. certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. I'm just looking at a picture of Sam Wanamaker right now. <laughs> you know, he moved when he was an actor. He moved to the UK because he was afraid of being blacklisted. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Then he came back and directed a lot of a lot of really uh, kind of epic television in the in the sixties and seventies. I mean, it's kind of kind of mad. He even he directed all the way into the eighties. He directed the last thing he did was a Columbo TV movie. Yeah, yeah. The eighties. It's, it's all it's, it's it's amazing. These folks, you look at them. How much of that material we we watched but didn't know we were watching yeah. that particular material by that particular guy. Yeah. Sam Wanamaker. That Crazy. hair always cracked me the hell up. Yeah. Uh, um, I got the line from Primary Colors, too, by the way. Uh, I had to look that up. I had to look it up. Billy Bob Thornton playing Richard Jemmons, basically a thinly veiled version uh, of uh, Jimmy Carvel. Car- of James, James Carvel. Carvel. Yeah. Uh, you just called me a redneck, which I'm proud to say I am. And you, Hodgkiss, are a honky. You just look black. <laughs> and it's the best part of you. Let's you intimidate the pale faces, especially lib labs. Let's you work that voodoo sexual mm, on white girls. Well, I'm probably blacker than you are. I got some slave in me. I can feel it. <laughs> Can't write 
That is, any you can't of that write any of that today. today. Not, not, no. Can't make, oh, the, man. The development executives would lose their minds. Oh, they were like, yes, you. <laughs> oh, are you kidding me? The notes. Talk about the notes. Oh, my God. Uh, Mountain Rest uh, with Francis Conroy, uh, which, which is actually a very good and poignant movie, it has a lot to do with, in, in common with, uh, say, Woody Allen's September. Yep. It sure does. Uh, about, it's about this actress, uh, elderly actress who's moved off to this mountain. Uh, she's estranged from her daughter and her granddaughter, but she wants them to come and see her, you know, so that they can put some things to rest. And, and you know, it's it's just a pretty sort of heavy uh, drama, but it's it's you know, but it's moving in an Ingmar Bergman film kind of way. Uh, and Frances Conroy, uh, what what can one say about her? She's absolutely uh, fantastic. Special features include uh, interviews and deleted scenes and uh, the trailer. Fantastic. Should I do TV? Uh, yeah, let's ju- jump into the TV. Well, I'll, I'll do this. I'll do this set right here for sure yeah. because you know how I am about my Doctor Who. So uh, from the BBC, from the BBC, um, uh, a number of seasons of Doctor Who. Let me see if I can put them in order to speak to here. So we have, uh, let's see, Doctor Who, the Time Meddler. This is from the William Hartnell years, 1963-1966. Um, uh, I, I, I adore all of the Doctor Whos. Uh, they're, all, they're all fantastic as far as I'm concerned. I have no issues with any Doctor Whos. I happen to be a Tom Baker man. Yeah. But I love the series during this period. It changed a lot uh, from, from when William played the character to the way it worked the, the you know the granddaughter stuff went away as as we sort of moved forward into the series but these are still really wonderful episodes these are almost all on set these William Hartnell years a series dvd extras are just packed here including audio commentary from uh, the producer Verity Lambert uh, and Peter Purvis and so many other people uh, Donald Toth Barry. so you know if you're if you're a doctor who completist you're definitely going to want that also uh, in that pack, we pop over to Patrick Patrick Troughton, 1966-1969, uh, came in right after Will Hartnell. Uh, this is when we got to meet the Daleks, I believe, uh, when he was there. Again, packed with all sorts of stuff. Series was still in black and white uh, at this period and a lot of fun. Um, then we pop over to Sean Pertwee, who I also love. I, I, I love that Sean Pertwee's son plays uh, Alfred, uh, yeah, the butler yeah. on uh, 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 Gotham. Yeah, uh, it, because he 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 looks now exactly like his father did in 1970, 74. And I always thought to myself, put a wig on him and wrap it and put him in that sort of dandy outfit that John Pertwee used to wear, and he would yep. be a perfect, you know, yeah, yeah, little reboot of that. This one is kind of neat because it crosses over a little bit between uh, Troughton and Hartnell and Pertwee. We see that the you know the, that that thing that the uh, that the Doctor does, and then uh, we have the straight up uh, John Pertwee years, uh, 1970, 1974. Planet of the Spiders, uh, that series was absolutely fantastic. And then, of course, for me, 1974, 1981, the Tom Baker years, Doctor Who, uh, The Sunmakers, which, again, was a fantastic uh, series that went on there. That in- included in that series is the character Layla, uh, uh, who is this female uh, sort of barbarian jungle girl that the Doctor picks up on one of his travels. And I really, really loved her character coming into the series because it marked a transition from treating the women sort of like as girls who fall down and just sort of like ran around behind the doctor and screamed a lot. Uh, her character changed all of that and, 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 and as we move forward to having a female doctor today, a female doctor today, you can start to see that transition here with Layla's character. She had a knife and she simply wanted to kill everything. There you go. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's my kind of girl. <laughs> you, you think it through, Doc. When you're done over there, I'm going to stab it. Uh, and I, you got to love that. So the uh, second season of Titans is about to uh, premiere on September 6th, and uh, I didn't even know that this existed. And I, I pride myself on keeping track of all of the Berlanti stuff that, uh, the, you know, the, all, all the DC Universe Berlanti yeah, Greg stuff. Yeah, Berlanti, yeah. Uh, you, you know, Supergirl and uh, the, all the Arrowverse stuff. Supergirl and, and uh, Bat, Batwoman is now added. The Flash, obviously, I'm obsessed with. Uh, and, and Arrow. And... Um, and and then I, I discovered that there's this thing called Titans. I had no idea. I had no idea. It, it was on TNT. I, I absolutely no clue that this show even existed. It's a it's the strangest thing. But um, here it is. And uh, first season is out on Blu-ray. And you know what? It's actually quite good. Um, it's not it's not part of the Arrowverse. It is. Uh, it seems to be nominally connected to Gotham. 
So they're not. It's not a, all a single universe, obviously, with all the TV shows. Uh, although it does seem like the new Alfred show on uh, Stars mm. is connected to Gotham. Ah, yeah, yeah. With you know, Alfred is the young yeah. spy guy. But um, anyway, this is this is basically uh, Teen Titans as a as a show. It they've started with four, a very simple four, which in call which is Robin, obviously the Dick Grayson Robin, along with uh, Raven, and Beast Boy and Starfire. And uh, the first season is very premium, 11 episodes. It's 11-episode arc. It's very impressive. It's really well put together. Akiva Goldsman worked on this with Greg Berlanti and Jeff Johns. So it's a good team of people. And uh, I, I think it's sharp, and I can't wait to see where they go with this show. Interesting. Uh, it also includes uh, 13 featurettes to go along with the 11 episodes. So I would I, I recommend checking that out. Uh, BB from the BBC. Just another extraordinary. Uh, this is the eighth eighth season of Call the Midlife. Yeah, uh, it's just another another outstanding, excellent British series. Uh, you know, they 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 do them uh, yeah, like nobody else can I do know. them. I know. Uh, particularly the ones that are set. I, I I'm particularly coming. I mean, sure, you had your Down Abbey set in the 30s and 40s, but the stuff that's set in the 60s. That mod pop yeah. era, yeah. Uh, where things were just sort of transitioning uh, all over the world, but certainly in the UK, and women were coming into their own power, and the women's movement was underway. Uh, that's those are the really interesting shows that they watch here, and very interesting sort of scenarios pop up in this series. So this is season eight. It's really really good. Call them at watch. Can't can't go wrong with that. Um, uh, Blu-ray and digital. Lonesome Dove. Man, this series. Uh, this uh, uh, television mi miniseries is, is, is what it was when it came out. It was just really a, um, uh, an extraordinary. It was, like, it was like watching an old school western, but on television. It was so true and so real. Tommy Lee Jones, Robert Duvall, Danny Glover, Diane Lane, Robert Yurick. Um, yeah, Robert Yurick still had hair back then. That was, uh, that, that was, <laughs> that was lovely, too. Anyway, uh, really, really great series, mostly directed by Simon Windsor. Uh, bonus features include the making of the epic series and the, 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 the casting interviews and original sketches and your own location with them. Lonesome Dove, just a, just a beautiful movie, a uh, beautiful Western uh, television series. Uh, Forever Night, the complete series. This was an interesting concept for a series. Basically, you got yourself a 13th century vampire uh, living uh, in, 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 in uh, present-day Toronto. He doesn't want to be a vampire anymore, but he is. But he decides that one way that he can do to uh, atone for his previous life and perhaps uh, uh, achieve uh, the possibility of reverting to humanity is by becoming a cop and being a good cop and, uh, and, and, and take it. But he's you know, still a vampire. That's a good idea for a television series. That is a, that is a cool idea. I, I think so. Anyway, it lasted three seasons, 70 episodes. That's They're all in premise. this box. That's, yep, a, good that's a good premise. That's a good premise. That's a good premise. They're all in this box forever night, the complete series. We've got Murdoch Mysteries Season 12 on Blu-ray from Acorn and Acorn TV. Uh, look, this is basically a British detective show. Yeah, I know it's Canadian. It's set in Toronto, but it might as well not be. If this were set in 1895 London instead of 1895 Toronto, yeah, be the exact same show. The exact be, same be show. No I always enjoyed the Murdoch mystery. He's basically sort of Sherlock Holmes, but not. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and yeah. all that sort of period stuff is going on yeah, there. Yeah, you know. it's fun. And you know what? 12 seasons, it still sings. It still hums. Everybody knows their characters. Everybody's really, really right on the money. And the nice thing about this show is that it continues to... Um, it, it touches on a lot of the uh, the really interesting forensic developments yeah. that happen kind of turn of the century. It's yeah. like, you know, early CSI. Just, just that point as as, as... as they're starting to integrate science, science into, the into the, the uh, deductive And again, they enfranchised women in that show. They gave us... The, 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 the yeah. central coroner was yeah. a woman, and then yeah. she has a little sister. And, and so I love the way they, show. they were bright about doing that. It's a good show. 18 episodes in season 12. They just keep on trucking. This is one of the, one of the best things on Canadian and British uh, TV. Uh, here's a show that I didn't know existed. This is a Netflix show. Uh, everything gets lost on Netflix. Uh, this is this is Tim Cogshell's worst nightmare. <laughs> it is BoJack Horseman. I'm sorry, Are those you... talking animals. <laughs> <laughs> I will never forget. I can't even remember what movie it was, but this was years ago. It was right after we first met, and you you expressed how much anthropomorphized <laughs> cartoon characters drive you crazy. <laughs> Uh, the ones animals. that are only part of it, like Scooby Doo. Yeah. Look, if he can talk, he can talk. What the hell is that dog doing? <laughs> you know, it's bad enough that you got the talking dog. That dog ain't even talking. No, it's horrible. Uh, well, Bojack Horseman is this weird animated show. Uh, 25 episodes in first two seasons. 
together on this boxed set now. It is a collector's edition. It is seasons one and two. Uh, it's I know a, that show is meant to be a little dark and depressing. And just well, it's, very, it's supposed to be very. It's supposed to be very, um, uh, very kind of adult swimish. Yeah, it's, it's going for the adult swim audience. And the idea here is that in some weird alternative universe, uh, it's okay. They're like kind of animals and and ha- animal human hybrids and we all live together and nobody seems to really notice. Yeah. And Bojack Horseman is this dude, basically a dude with a head of a horse, who's having a midlife crisis. Like yeah. if Homer Simpson weren't quite so ridiculous and had the head of a horse and were a little and were like a character from Seinfeld or the or the or the the, the Bob Newhart show. <laughs> yeah. Uh that's what he is. He's ba- mm-hmm. you know what he is? He's basically Bill Daly from the Bob Newhart show. Uh, That's what yeah. he is with the head of a horse. Yeah, it's the yeah, weirdest yeah. thing in the world. And, de- and a little on the depressed side. So there's a, there's, there, there are commentaries on here. Don't help you understand what's going on. Uh, and, the, you know, it, I, it's... I think all those guys, uh, all those animators and writers are just avoiding going to therapy. Uh, it's, rather than go to therapy, they make that cartoon. It's a little bit... It, it reminds me a little bit of uh, King of the Hill in some aspects. And uh, it certainly has that same kind of acerbic quality to it. So it's a little Mike Judgey, but, uh, you know, hey, I, yeah, do I want to watch any more of it? Not really, nah. but, you yeah, know. It's, it's funny, it's, but it, it, left it, me it, has, a little, it left me a little depressed yeah. every episode. <laughs> you know, I'm Absolutely. like, this is funny, but I don't feel good about myself. Yeah, I hear you. And then the complete first season of Manifest, uh, another new series that just went completely under my radar. Yeah, uh, This is a, a Warner Brothers series. That uh, I, I, it, you know, it's a, it's it means to be kind of a, a nostalgic show, um, like we might have had in the eighties, maybe early eighties, mm-hmm. late seventies is is kind of what it seems to hearken to, um, but but I'm not sure that it really kind of pulls it off. It wants to split that with Lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? It's, it wants it's to be trying like to do a, that Losty kind of thing. It wants to be what some, happened? What's like going on? Falcon Crest meets Lost. Yeah, maybe is what's what's going on here. Um, you know, it, it centers on this this uh, maybe airplane. Yeah, it's, it's a touch of airplane in here too, right? Yeah, Lost, yeah. Meet, Lost meets airplane. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because uh, the plane, the, the plane, the plane disappears. It's gone for I don't know five years, yeah. something like that. Then comes back, and everybody on the plane is. The same age as they were when the plane disappeared, uh, so you know something wacky's going on. It's a good cast, but uh, but you know Lost. And you know they of... they never the thing that bugged me about about that series and Lost too for that matter. Yeah, is they never really get to it. They never yeah. really just say this is what happened, folks. Yeah. You know, and I'm sorry, I don't want to be left dangling like that. You know, you start a story like this, I want you to take me home, get me across the finish line. Yeah. Lost didn't do it. No. You know, and, and they didn't know where they were going. They didn't know where they were going, and, uh, yeah. and so Lindor rabbit hole was, after yeah. rabbit hole after yeah. rabbit hole. And then next thing you know, you're just in the damn rabbit hole. Uh, you know, as long as we, we got right at the end of the show here, let me just make a quick mention of a uh, an anime. We got a bunch of anime that we're going to hold off until next week. But uh, Shout keeps giving us some really, really great animated anime titles. Thanks to G Kids, Shout and G Kids have a thing going on right now together. And uh, there are other arrangements that Shout is making with other companies so that they can they can bolster all of their uh, their uh, animation and anime bona fides. And one of them is a really interesting movie called Penguin Highway. Um, this is a, a, a completely beautiful movie. I had no idea it even existed. It's one of the most interesting anime films uh, that I've seen in the last 20 years, I would say at least. And uh, it's deal it, as much anime always does. It often does. It deals with kids. And in this case, these are like kid scientists uh, living in the suburb, way far away from the ocean. And penguins start appearing, mm. and it's and, and of course it, it winds up you know they have to sort of do the thing that kids do in Stranger Things and everything else. They got to get to the bottom of the mystery, the bottom. So it does have that quality yeah. to it. Yeah. But there's more to it. Like it's very symbolic. This is almost an allegory, and I won't tell you know mm. as anime and a lot of Japanese stuff often is. Allegory is a big part of it. You know, the number 1,000 uh, volume of the Criterion Collection is coming out, and it's going to be all the Godzilla movies on uh, Criterion, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, Godzilla is an allegory, too. Yeah, yeah. They kind of forgot that. about that in the middle in the middle uh, 80s and 2000s. <laughs> yes, they did. And then they, oh. Well, we yeah, we got to get back to that. It was about nuclear war. But uh, Penguin Highway is a beautiful, beautiful movie. It is really sweet. It is one, it's touching. It's lovely. They include a, uh, an interview with the director, uh, Hirayasu Ishida, not terribly well-known to me, at least. 
uh, the author of the original material, and uh, it's, it's, it's really lovely. So Penguin Highway, check that out on a Blu-ray DVD combo set from Shop Factory. With that, we are done, and uh, we will see you guys next week. Go see, go see Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. In, in Hollywood. Uh, two hours and 40 minutes, is that about right? That's it, yeah. Yeah, yeah worth it. Yeah.